are in the book of Psalms. Amen. And we are zoomed in on Psalms 23. And I'm going to go ahead and look at verse 1 here and just read through it. It's a, a six-verse psalm, but it's so beautiful. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beautiful. Verse 5 is where we're at in our studies, and we're going to zoom in on Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That's going to be our key verse today. Uh, last week, we talked about the rod of God. I hope you enjoyed that lesson as much as I did studying it, preparing for it. There was uh, so much in the, the rod, Aaron's rod that budded, the rod that was placed in the Ark of the Covenant and was used in all of those great miracles. It was a beautiful study. So we're going to, we see when we look at the rod, how the shepherd would prepare the rod. He could use it to, uh, as a defense. He could throw the rod at animals. If he, Mr. Keller here, who, who wrote the uh, shepherd looks at Psalms 23, he said he would watch these shepherd shepherds out there practicing with their rods, throwing them, seeing what they could hit so they could get real accurate. And if they saw any kind of an enemy come up around their sheep to protect their sheep, they would defend the flock with the rod. They could also use the rod to, to move a sheep close to them, have contact with the sheep, to look through the sheep's wool, to examine the sheep as they passed under the rod and came into the fold. And the rod could also be used for discipline. So Paul said he was stoned and he was beaten with rods. So those are uh, forms of discipline. So these are all things that we see in the rod. So today I want to um, move a little further into our studies, and we're going to see the shepherd as he's going to journey into the grasslands before the sheep even get there, before the sheep even know where they're going. The shepherd already knows, and he goes before them and prepares a table. He's going to prepare a place for them. And you know, God is never caught off guard. I remember when I was growing up, it was the Boy Scout motto. Anybody remember the Boy Scout motto? Be prepared, right? Be prepared is the Boy Scout motto. So you have to be prepared because you never know what you're going to encounter. And if you are prepared, whatever comes your way, you're, you're ready for it. And that is exactly how I uh, picture God, you know, be prepared. He's always prepared for whatever happens in our life. It doesn't catch him by surprise. Thou preparest. See, that's how it starts. God is preparing a table before me. Before I ever even get there, when I'm on my way, he knows what I have need of before I can even think of it or ask He's already made a way for me. Amen. That's the kind of a God we serve in the presence of mine enemies. So here we are back into uh, a shepherd looks at Psalms 23, and he's going to, he has a chapter here where he focuses on the phrase, thou preparest a table before me. So early in the season, before all the snow has been melted by spring sunshine, he will go ahead and make preliminary survey trips into this rough, wild country. He will look it over with great care, keeping ever in mind its best use for his flock during the coming season. 
So think about that as you consider your God. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He's always watching over you. He knows three turns ahead what's coming. He knows the end from the beginning. As one man described it, we play checkers, he plays chess. There's a big difference between checkers and chess, if you are familiar with it at all. Chess, you've got to be like four moves ahead of what you think your opponent is about to do. That's how God is with the enemy. If they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Right? He was way ahead of the, the devil, planning for every possible contingency. God is prepared for whatever you're facing in your life. You know, sometimes we sit around and we worry about tomorrow. You know what? That's God's job, right? He said, take no thought for tomorrow. Take no thought. Look at the birds, how God provides for the birds. Look at the lilies of the field, how God takes care of them. You're of much more value to God than any of those things. And so we can see in the shepherd the preparation, the care, the concern that God has for us. And I'm going to show you some scriptures where it specifically says God prepared, or he says, I prepare. I've, and you're going to see it. It's going to inspire you to realize that God is preparing for your good. He's making all things work together for your good. Then it says, then just before the sheep arrive, he will make another expedition or two to prepare the table land for them. The intelligent, careful manager will also decide well ahead of time where his camps will be located so the sheep will have the best rounds. Now, the table is the mesa, and we use that, we use that term now. It's a geographical term, a mesa. Is mesa a table? Is that how you say it in Spanish? Yes. And so it's like a, a land that is laid out for the sheep to just walk over there and enjoy the green grass that God has prepared for them on this table. So that's kind of what he thinks of as a table land. I know we think of when we see the word table, we're thinking we're sitting at the table eating dinner. But he's actually talking about a piece of ground that he's preparing for the sheep to go to. He goes over the range carefully to determine how vigorous the grass and upland vegetation is. At this time, he decides whether some glades and basins can be used only lightly, whereas other slopes and meadows may be grazed more heavily. And so he's looking at the ground and he's assessing, I can keep the sheep here for just a few days because the grass is not very dense and it won't sustain them for very long. And then I'm prepared to move them over here to, to this other grass that is heavier and can sustain them. Think about how the Lord sustains us. Whatever you're going through, you just cast your burden upon the Lord. How many times have you thought to yourself, I don't know if I can keep going at this pace. I don't know if I'm going to have sufficient resources to make it through this challenge. I need a move of God in my life. I need a miracle. Well, guess what? He's already looked at the grass there, and he realizes it's time to move you over to here. Sometimes God says, hey, the brook has dried up. The brook has dried up. It's time to get up and go to Zarephath. Well, Lord, uh, I don't know if I want to go to Zarephath. That's uh, Zidon. That's where Jezebel's from. That's like her hometown. You're asking me to walk to Zarephath? God said, I have provided a widow woman there to sustain me. God already has a plan. He knows what the next step is. In fact, he knows two or three steps ahead. That's what you see in the shepherd. He says, I'm going to have them here for a couple of days. Then once they start to eat that grass down, I'll move them over here. He's managing. Hey, I want God to be my manager. I'm tired of trying to manage things myself because I've noticed that when I try to manage things by myself, the uh, month is more than the bills. <laughs> I got more months than I do bills. <laughs> but when I put it in God's hands and he's my manager, it just seems like all things work together for good. 
all things work together for good when I allow him to be my shepherd. When I try to take the reins and start going where I want to go, before long, I'm astray. I've wandered off, and I find myself like that sheep we saw in the picture last week. He had his head in a pot. <laughs> well, it seemed like a good idea at the time when he was sticking his head in that pot looking for something, but all of a sudden he found himself stuck. Have you ever got yourself in a jam because you wandered away from what you knew God wanted you to do, from what you knew that God wanted you to do, the place that God was taking you? It's kind of like David when he turned and, and he, instead of turning to God, he found himself in the land of the Philistines. Amen. That was a very tragic time in his life. And then his family gets taken away, the camp gets raided, and his own men begin to look at him and go, you know, you turned away from God. You have us in the land of the Philistines. You caused all this to come upon us by your actions. And then they spake of stoning him. What does it say? David encouraged himself in the Lord. And that's what we need to do. We need to turn back to God. When you feel yourself getting off course, when you're drifting away from the path that God wants you to be on, guess what he's saying to you? Come home. Amen. Sometimes when you have gone astray, it's time to make it back to the shepherd. The grass may seem greener over on that other ridge. And there's a lot of things in our lives that sometimes we make out to be more important than God, but it's really not. Amen. That's good teaching right there. You get away from God and you find yourself over here and all of a sudden you realize this grass is not greener. And I had it a whole lot better when God was running things. That's when you need to turn your heart toward home and find your way back to the shepherd. The shepherd, he looks at the slopes and the meadows, which may be grazed more heavily. He will check to see if there are poisonous weeds appearing, and if so, he will plan his grazing program to avoid them or take drastic steps to eradicate them. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, I tell you, if we would just learn to lean upon him and not trust our own understanding, just put it in his hands and all our ways acknowledge him. Lord, you're my shepherd, and I need you to take control of my life and my steps and the things that I'm doing. Lead me to the paths, Lord, that you want me to be on. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even if, for some reason, he should take me through the valley, I won't fear because I know he's with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. Just knowing that he is there brings a comfort in my life. I don't want to be apart from the shepherd. I don't want to be alone I want to be close to him. Amen. Beautiful. Beautiful study. Prepare to make ready beforehand for some purpose, use, or activity. There you go. When you look in your life and you know that God has gone before you to prepare. How many times have you ever had an important meeting with someone and you prayed and you were like, God, this I really want this to come out good. I want your will in this. I pray you will just go before me and speak to their heart. And when you get in there, you can just tell God has gone before you and just softened their heart to hear what you have to say. God can prepare them by putting them in the proper state of mind. Prepare also means to work out the details, to plan in advance. That's exactly what I want in my life. I want God to prepare. Now, I can work and work, and I have a plan in my mind, and I could be way away from where God wants me to be. I look back at my life, and I realize if I had it to do all over again, 
I would serve Jesus every day of my life. I mean, they ought to write a song about that, huh? <laughs> I think they did. But yeah, if I had a chance to do it all over again, that's what I would do different. All of the times that I tried to figure it out, that I reached my hand in there and I started trying to do it my way. I don't care what that big song and they sing in Vegas, I did it my way. Hey, you'll mess it up when you do it your way, right? It's much better if you allow God to do it his way. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His understanding is so much better than ours. Put it in his hands, into the hands of the shepherd. Thou preparest the table before me. This is from, I'm gonna look, I looked at a couple of my favorite uh, concordances where they were commenting on this verse. This is from the Treasury of David by uh, Spurgeon, which is an outstanding commentary. He commentary is a commentary just on the Psalms. And he calls it the treasury of David. And he goes through every one of the Psalms and, and he brings out some beautiful thoughts. He says, when a soldier is in the presence of his enemies, if he eats it all, he snatches a hasty meal and away he hastens to the fight. So as he's eating, he's got one eye looking around because he's in the presence of his enemies. But observe. Thou preparest the table. Nothing is hurried. There is no confusion, no disturbance. The enemy is at the door, and yet God prepares a table. The Christian sits down and eats as if everything were in perfect peace. Oh, the peace which Jehovah gives to his people, even in the midst of the most trying circumstances. That's what this verse says to me, no matter what you are going through in this life, God is there, preparing, working behind the scenes, making everything come out perfect. It reminds me of that scripture where it says, the governor tasted the wine, and he said, this is the best. You saved the best until the end. He didn't know that there was just water that had been put in those pots. It says, but the servants who made the water knew, that put the water in there, they knew. I know where the miracles come from. I know the master of the wind. I know the one who has the cattle of a thousand hills. I know the one who watches over my life day and night. And I feel peace in my heart knowing that God is with me. Amen. Amen. I tell you, it just puts away fear. It just takes fear out of your heart when you just trust in the Lord with all your heart and you lean on him. Even in the most dire and dangerous circumstances you could ever find yourself in, you can still have a peace. In fact, it says perfect peace. Peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. That's pretty good. It ought to be in the Bible, huh? Amen. That is in the Bible. Hallelujah. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. This is from the pulpit commentary. Another transition. The danger of death is past. He's referring to the previous verse where he was walking through the shadow of, valley of the shadow of death. David reversed to the thought of tranquil, a tranquil, happy, joyous time which God has vouchsafed to grant him. He has adversaries indeed, but they are powerless. Woo! They are powerless to affect anything against him. They have to look on him with ill-concealed annoyance at his prosperity to see his table amply spread. Amen. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. I have a God. And even if it seems like I'm down, you know what? I'm not going to stay down. Amen. It's kind of like, like a cork. You ever seen the cork when it goes under the water? What does it do? Pops right back up. And there's the devil trying to push you down, and you're just like this cork. Pop right back up. 
Amen. When you have the joy of the Lord is your strength. When you put it all in God's hands and you trust him, you can be at peace. The peace of God which passes all understanding. People can't understand how you could be so relaxed and calm in the midst of trials and circumstances in your life. It's because you have a God. You have a shepherd. Beautiful. And then here is Matthew Henry's commentary. The Lord's people feast at his table upon the provisions of his love. Woo! Satan and wicked men are not able to destroy their comforts while they are anointed with the Holy Spirit and drink the cup of salvation, which is ever full. Past experiences teaches believers to trust that the goodness and mercy of God will follow them all the days of their life. Beautiful. So as you study through this psalm, I want to encourage you to say, Lord, be my shepherd. I need a shepherd. I don't want to try to make it through this life on my own. There's too many dangers. There's too many uncertainties, too many circumstances that I would have to face. I am a sheep in need of a shepherd. I need you, Lord. I need your help every day. Praise God. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You know those sheep will sit out there and they're eating from that grass and I guarantee you they're not doing this. The sheep are at ease, peacefully eating the grass, not a concern or care in the world. That's what God is wanting us to see in this chapter. Put our trust in him. He leads us beside the still waters. He brings us to a place where we can eat, and he provides for our needs. Come and dine, the master calleth. Come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table all the time. Amen? It's just a beautiful study to realize that God can lead you beside these still, crystal clear waters. And he's prepared that. He's gone ahead and he's picked out the best streams for you to drink from. The best fields for you to eat from. He's removed all of the, the dangers that can hurt you. He wants to be your shepherd. But you have to follow him. He said, my sheep hear my voice. When he calls to you and he says, it's time to pray. Do you listen to his spirit and say, God, I am ready. I'm ready to pray. I'm ready to get closer to you. It's so important. Thou preparest a table. Does that rabbit look concerned? Well, he is a rabbit. He better kind of keep his head on a swivel and look around. But he's in a beautiful field out there eating that soft grass. And that's where God wants to take us. When we come into his house, he prepares a table for us to eat from. This is, uh, Philip Keller is going to talk a little more about his experiences as a shepherd. He said, unknown to me, the first sheep ranch I owned had a rather prolific native strain of both blue and white camas. The blue camas were a delightful sight in the spring when they bloomed along the beaches. The white camas, though a much less conspicuous fire, flower, were also quite attractive, but a deadly menace to the sheep. If lambs in particular ate or even just nibbled a few of these lily-like leaves, they emerged in the grass sward during spring, it would spell certain death. So when he went to look at the field and he saw these little white flowers coming up, he knew that they were dangerous to his sheep. It says, the lambs would become paralyzed, stiffen up like blocks of wood, and simply succumb to the toxic poisons from the plants. 
So does that sound like a place the shepherd wants to take his sheep and just install them into this field and put them amongst all these poisonous plants? My youngsters and I spent days and days going over the ground, plucking out these poisonous plants. It was a recurring task that was done every spring before the sheep went on these pastures. Though tedious and tiring with all of the bending, it was a case of preparing the table in the presence of mine enemies. If my sheep were to survive, it simply had to be done. And so think of that care, the care and the concern, the attention to detail that this shepherd is showing you that him and his children did. They went through the field section by section, pulling out every one of these plants to keep the sheep from being injured. It had to be done. All of this sort of thing was in the back of David's mind as he pins these lines. I can picture him walking slowly over the summer range ahead of his flock. His eagle eye is sharp for any sign of poisonous weeds, which he would pluck before his sheep got to them. No doubt he had armfuls to get rid of for the safety of his flock. The parallel in the Christian life is clear. Like sheep and especially lamb, we somehow feel that we have to try everything that comes our way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amen. All we like sheep have gone astray. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He paid the price for us. The wages of sin is death. But, aren't you glad that verse doesn't just stop there? The wages of sin is death. But, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Aren't you thankful that he took away the sting of sin and death for us? He came and he paid the price for us. Why? Because he loves us. Just as the shepherd went into the field and removed the things that could bring certain death to his sheep, Jesus came, robed himself in flesh, became sin for us, and paid the penalty for our sins. Aren't you thankful to have a shepherd? He is the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Amen. Praise God. We have to taste this thing and that, sampling everything just to see what it's like. And we may very well know that some things are deadly. They can do us no good. They can be most destructive. Still, somehow, we give them a whirl anyway. Talking about human nature. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, what did he tell them? The day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. But they had to give it a try. It's human nature. But you know what? God was prepared. From the foundation of the world, he already had the plan. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. God was prepared. He was not caught off guard. He already made a way for us. He is a way maker, a promise keeper, light in the darkness. He loves you. Amen. That's the message I see in Psalms 23. Our shepherd loves us. He cares for us. He watches over us. He keeps us. He protects us. He guides us. He strengthens us. He's always there every day looking out for our good. Aren't you thankful you have a shepherd? Hallelujah. I'm so thankful that God watches over me even in the times when I've been stubborn. I mean, I know none of y'all have to worry about that, but there's been times when I've been a little bit stubborn and I've kind of wandered away from the place that I should be. But you know what? He was there all the time. 
He came looking for me and found me and brought me back home. Amen. In all of this, there is an amazing mystery. No one will ever be able to fathom its implications. It is bound up inexorably with the concept of God's divine love. And that's really, I think, Philip Killer, Keller nailed it right there in his book. Oh, how he loves you and me. That's why he put this chapter in here for us to see. David, a man who was not perfect, he was able to say, my God rescued me. My God restored me. You see that in here? He restores my soul. And we've all had our souls marred by pain, bitterness, loss. There's been times when our human nature has risen up and we have been not quite so spiritual, a little more carnal. But through it all, God continues to love us. And he's drawing us home. I'm not perfect, just forgiven. Amen. God restores. He watches over us. Jesus told us himself that he had come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Just as the sheep man is thrilled beyond words to see his sheep thriving on the high, rich summer range, it is one of the highlights of the whole year. So my shepherd is immensely pleased when he sees me flourish. God wants you to have joy. He does. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to have victory. He wants you to be an overcomer. He wants you to walk on streets of gold. He wants you to be successful. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to grow. And he's made every provision. He has already provided all that you need to be successful. And he's with you every step of the way. God prepared the way. And here I'm going to show you an example. God prepared the way when he warned Peter. Satan desires to tempt him and to sift him like wheat. What was he doing there? He was pointing out that there is an enemy, there is an adversary, there is someone who is desiring to attack you, Peter. Whatever situation you're in, when the enemy comes against you, you do not face these challenges alone. If you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Why? Because we have the name that's above every name. In the name of Jesus... Hallelujah. In the name of our shepherd, in the name of Jesus, the demons will have to flee. Christ pointed out that he had prayed Peter's faith might not fail during the desperate difficulty he would encounter. And so it is even today. Our great shepherd is going ahead of us in every situation, anticipating what danger we may encounter and praying for us. In fact, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. That's a pretty beautiful scripture right there, isn't it? To know that he ever lives. And what is he doing? He's making intercession for us. We have a high priest who can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Amen. We have a high priest who knows what we're going through. Why? Because he robed himself in flesh and he was tempted in all points like as we are. He knows. I want to show you a couple of scriptures to encourage you that God prepares. It says in Exodus 23 and 20, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way 
Amen. Isn't that beautiful? He's going to protect you. And he's going to bring you. So this angel is going to protect you and guide you. Where? To the place which I have prepared. That's pretty awesome. That's, of course, that's the promised land. He's taking them to the promised land. You see that in Exodus. Here in Isaiah 64, For since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by ear, neither has I seen, O God, beside thee, what he has prepared. And, of course, that's followed up in 1 Corinthians 2 and 10. But the Spirit, he has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, right? Paul quotes that scripture. But there you see, the things which God has prepared. There are things which God has prepared for us. And, and that's an exciting thought. How about this one? Jonah jumped on a ship and he was fleeing from God. Guess what? God was not caught off guard, was he? I've already got a plan ready. He prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Amen. And then when Jonah went to preach to the people, they, they received his message. And he got bad because they received his message. <laughs> so he sat down to pout, and God prepared a gourd so that it would give him some shade. Isn't that something? The Lord prepared a gourd and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. He brings shade in our life. And helps us during our trying times. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into this world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. Isn't that beautiful? God is a spirit. You believe that? God is a spirit. A spirit has not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. That's what Jesus said. The sacrifices and offerings of the past could not put away sin. What he needed was a spotless lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not. The, the Levitical law, those sacrifices, they're not going to do it but a body thou hast prepared me. God already had the plan. He already had it prepared from the foundation of the world. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Man, beautiful. How about this one? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Amen. He has gone ahead. He's there preparing a place for us. Beautiful. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw the, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared. That's what it says. Everything is going to be ready. It's prepared. When you get there, he's prepared a place for you. He's prepared a place for your loved ones who have gone on before. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelations 19 and 9. He saith unto me, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings. So there's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now think about how he prepares a table. Right? He's prepared this marriage supper of the Lamb for us. There's the scripture, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemy. So I was thinking about that scripture because it tells us here in Matthew 22 that you are invited 
Amen. You all are hereby invited to a feast, right? Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Beautiful, huh? But look at that last line. And they would not come. Well, Lord, I realize you're calling me to get closer to you, to, to put you first in my life, to put the things of God first in my life. But you got to understand, God, I have things going on. I'm kind of busy. Now, that scripture right there really should strike home to your heart. It says, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. The bride of Christ. Amen. Won't that be wonderful? The marriage supper of the Lamb, and we are the bride of Christ. But they made light of it, went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. Now, the farm's not sinful. Merchandise is not wrong. But when it comes in between you and God, it is. This is from uh, Matthew Henry's commentary. Looking at Matthew 22. This just jumped out at me when I was reading this. The provision made for perishing souls in the gospel is represented by a royal feast made by a king. That's what God is comparing it to, the kingdom of heaven. When we make it into his presence, our merciful God has not only provided food, but a royal feast. For the perishing souls of his rebellious creatures, there is enough and to spare of everything that can add to our present comfort and everlasting happiness. The guests first invited were the Jews when the prophets of the Old Testament prevailed not, nor John the Baptist, nor Christ himself, who told them the kingdom of God was at hand. The apostles and ministers of the gospels were sent after Christ's resurrection to tell them it was come and to persuade them to accept the offer. The reason why sinners come not to Christ and salvation by him is not because they cannot, but because they will not. He has prepared a marriage supper of the Lamb. He has prepared a throne of grace where we can come into his presence at any time. You have access to the king at any moment. Amen. They were careless. Multitudes perish forever through mere carelessness. It's not that they don't like God. It's what it says here. Who show no direct aversion, but are simply careless. Oh, I never want to make light of God's presence. Any chance I have to move into his presence and get close to him. Anytime I hear that small, still voice calling me to a place of prayer, I never want to push that off and put it aside. Oh, but there is a hunger in my soul that says, God, I need more of you. The things of this life, I've had my fill. And yet, I hunger still. More of you. When's the last time you said that to the Lord? More of you. I need more of you, God. I want to step up to the table that you have prepared before me. My enemies are all around me, but I am not afraid. I live in this dangerous world, Lord, but I am not worried. I'm not concerned. I have a shepherd who's watching over me every step of the way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let me go forward to my song here. We are out of time right now. 
Let's play this song right here. Let's turn our hearts towards the Lord. He has prepared a table before you. That's what I want you to think about this morning. Think about the table that he has prepared and tell him that you are ready for what he has for you. <laughs> 